We are in the book of Ruth still, and we're in chapter 2. We're coming to the end of chapter 2 today. And we're going to talk about the subject of redemption. In fact, the title for this message is, What is a Goel? Anybody know? Don knows what a Goel. Anybody else know what a Goel is? Sounds like a pejorative term, doesn't it? You know, some, something you'd call somebody if you didn't like them. You Goel, you. That's not exactly what it is. We're going to find out what a Goel is. But just as a hint, we're going to talk one of the subjects, or the main subject, is the subject of redemption. Now, I think I shared this probably a while ago, probably last time I talked about redemption. Anybody old enough to remember when you needed money and you were a kid, the one sure way you could get a few cents was to go look for pop bottles. Anybody ever do that? All right. That means you're, you're old. <laughs> All right, if we, you know, I played a lot of baseball, played a lot of stuff when I was a kid, so if we needed a ball, and we always did, you know, we played baseball with bats that had been broken about 10 times. We put nails in them so that we'd toughen our hands up, you know, nails would start popping through. So we didn't have aluminum bats in those days, and we, we, we played with a baseball until the cover was ripped off, and it was just string, and we put tape on it. And so when it got to that point, we knew we had, to start ra we had to start a fundraiser for the children's baseball fund. So we would start looking for pop bottles. And I could, you know, we could find Pepsi or a Coke bottle. They, they didn't have a whole bunch of flavors, just Pepsi and Coke, right? And I think RC was out in those days. So then 7-Up. So those are the four biggies. So we'd find pop bottles around, because in those days, people didn't care about littering. They just threw them all over the place. And so we would find pop bottles, take them to the store and get three cents a piece and uh, make enough money to buy a ball. Well, that, that's called what? The price that they give you back is called what? Redemption. A redemption. The redemption value of the pop bottle is th was three cents. And so it was kind of like the pop bottle was on loan to you and then the store would buy it back for three cents. It was actually a pretty good recycling deal. Well, that, that's redemption. That's redemption, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning in the book of Ruth. And one thing I want you to remember is that redemption always costs someone something. There's always a cost to redemption. If you're redeeming yourself in a relationship, for example, the cost is you've got to humble yourself and probably go apologize and make things right. The other person has to forgive. So there's kind of a cost on both your part. You to humble yourself, the other person to forgive. So there's always a cost at redemption in setting things right. So here's what this message is about today. Boaz is identified as a goel for Naomi's family. This foreshadows the work of Jesus as our goel. And again, we'll define that in a little bit. Purpose of the message, to show how the Old Testament tradition of having kinsmen redeemers that's what the word goel means. Kinsman redeemers anticipates the redemptive work of Jesus. All right, so that's where we're going today. So I want you just to set the story again. In chapter 1, Naomi and her husband Elimelech and Malon and Kilion, their sons, there's a famine. They live in Bethlehem, so this is kind of Bethlehem before Jesus. They live in Bethlehem. This takes place during the time of the judges, so we're, we're going back more than 1,000 B.C. here, all right? So it takes place during those days, and it's, it's really not a good time. There's no unity in the nation of Israel. Everybody's doing according to what they want, according to Scripture. It was a bad time. They weren't really following after God who had brought them out of Egypt into the Promised Land. There was a famine, and so Elimelech moved his family from, from Judah and Bethlehem to Moab. Moab was a neighboring company, uh, country. Moab, Moabites were not well liked by Jews and vice versa. Yet they went there anyway because there was food. So they moved there, probably only intending to go for a little while, but um, they end up staying for a good time. And Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi a widow in a foreign land. But there's two sons, and they marry. Malon, I told you last week, that it doesn't tell us who they married, but it does in chapter 4. Ruth married Malon. And, and, uh, and, and the other, Orpah, ma married Kilion. Well, Malon and Kilion both die. 
So now we got three widows, two of them living in their homeland, but one, Naomi, living in a foreign country. The famine eases up in Judah, so Naomi comes back. She tells her daughters-in-law, look, stay here. They love her. They don't want to leave her, uh, but Orpah does, and she stays, but Ruth makes that famous statement, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. That's a big deal for a Moabite to be saying that to an Israelite in those days. It's basically saying, I'm converting from my paganism to worship your God, Yahweh. Even though there was no external reason to do so, I mean, they were destitute. So there was a pretty tight relationship. I think we need to give Naomi some credit for that. She really, she really did nurture these two young women. So they go back, and Naomi is, her name means pleasant, but she, everybody's saying, oh my goodness, this Naomi? And she said, don't call me that anymore, call me bitter. Call me Mara, because I am bitter. I'm bitter, the hand of the Almighty is against me. What can anybody do when the hand of the Almighty is against them? She is depressed as she comes back, as you might imagine. She is, she is now a widow, and she's an older widow. There's no chance for her to remarry and have children again to take care of her. It is just her and Ruth. And, and for, for a, a Jewish person with a husband gone, and we don't know, we know that Elimelech had probably sold off his land because it's going to have to be redeemed later on here. To, to be a widow with no land, no prospects was a, 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 as bad as it got. And so there they were. And, and Naomi was so messed up emotionally, she really couldn't do anything about it. So Ruth says, look, why don't I go out and glean? You know, it's harvest time. There's a ray of hope there. It's harvest time, and there's actually grain in Judah. So she says, why, can't, why don't I go out and glean? Which was the right of poor people to do in Israel. You could go glean the fields. Now, even though it was something that their God taught them to allow people to glean, you've got to know that probably not all farmers really welcomed that. But she goes to a field, and she is treated like royalty by this guy named Boaz. Who, and there's, there's a hint there that there's even some romantic interest going on. And, and so she, she gleans in Boaz's field, and she collects a lot of grain. So that's where we are. She, Boaz is unbelievably kind to her, even invites her to lunch. And at the end of the day, then Ruth goes home wherever home was. And that's where we pick up. So we're going to talk, first of all, about the windfall for Ruth and Naomi here. Here's a passage uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth chapter 2, verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over from being satisfied. So Ruth comes home from gleaning, and the passage says she had an ephah of grain. An ephah of grain is about 29 pounds. So that's a lot of grain for one day. Normally, what a, what a gleaner could be expected to glean in a day was maybe one to two pounds of grain. She got 29 pounds of grain. She had to lug the whole thing home by herself. 29 pounds. This means that Ruth collected a half month's wages in one day because of Boaz's generosity to her. And it speaks of that. And last week we talked about love always going, being a whole lot more than simple rule keeping. Boaz was, of course, keeping the rules about allowing gleaners, but he went way over that when it came to Ruth. Love always does that. It always goes the extra mile. It always goes way beyond simple rule keeping. You don't do things for Jesus simply to keep rules. You do things because he's won your heart. And, and that's the whole point. And it also speaks of Ruth's diligence. She was a hard worker. She, she was, she, you know, from morning till evening, she was there. And then besides the grain she got, she brought, out, she brought leftovers. Remember, Boaz had actually invited her to lunch, which was totally uncalled for. This is a foreign woman, a Moabite. And remember how the Moabite race got started? Class? Incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was how the Moabites happened. So they were very much looked down upon by the Israelites for that. 
for their origins. And so here's this foreign woman in Israel going out to glean, not knowing how she's going to be treated. And by the way, Bethlehem and all these communities, these were small communities. This is not like you can be anonymous and go, everybody knew everybody. Have you ever been in a small town that's like that? Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knows everybody's stuff, right? Everybody already knew who Naomi was, and they knew who Ruth was. And what's amazing is in the passage, Ruth has a very good reputation, which we talked about last week. Boaz told her, I've heard about you already. So all this points again to, to Boaz and, and going way beyond the simple rule keeping, and he practices faithful love. Remember, that's one of the themes in Ruth is that this Hebrew word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, it would be how you spell it in English. And it's, it's the word that you see throughout the Old Testament to describe God mostly. In the Psalms, it's usually translated in our versions, loving kindness, like your loving kindness is better than life. Those passages that have the word loving kindness, it is that Hebrew word hesed, which is impossible to translate with one English word. And the best we can come up with is faithful love. It's the kind of love that hangs on, the kind of love that doesn't give up. It's the kind of love that God has that, that is, is steadfast, unchangeable. And so Boaz is mirroring God's relationship with his people, which God was really hanging in there with his people, even though they had not given him much reason to do so. So his faithfulness to God, now get this, his faithfulness to God made a difference in how he dealt with people. And the Bible has always connected our love for God with our love for people. John does it, does it foremost in his epistle, which is, how can you say you love God but hate, hate your brother? All right, that, that's, that's a disconnect there. You can't, you can't say that. It always translates love for God equals Love for people. That's why Jesus said, a new command, I give you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, we're not talking about syrupy, sentimental type love. We're talking love in all of its various ways of being communicated, including when you have to say something difficult to someone or you have to confront the truth because Jesus' love was translated as truth and grace. He always dealt truthfully with people, but always graciously. We don't back down on either one. We don't back down on truth. We don't back down on grace. When we keep those things in there, because when you, when you, um, or we, we, when you lose grace from truth, it becomes pretty harsh, and it becomes a pretty good way to beat people up. When you divorce grace from truth, it's simple sentimentality. And so grace and truth together, it's like two sides of the same coin. That was Jesus. And that's the kind of love that Boaz is expressing to Ruth and others in this passage. All right, the second point today, so that's, that's the windfall. Second is the goel. Verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where? Did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Now, let's stop there for a second. That's a huge deal. Naomi was shocked with this result. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is, and by the way, that's the way it's written too, Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers, the, word, the Hebrew word goel. And Ruth the Moabite, just in case you forgot, and Ruth the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. And we talked about what that forms that assault could have taken. Uh, probably was not a sexual assault here. It was probably talking about just the kind of assault that gleaners would get from harvesters that didn't want them around. Get out of here, and even physically getting them off the property. So... So that's what um, was Naomi was saying. So here, Ruth comes home, 
back into the, into the village of Bethlehem. Two widows, one young, one old. The young widow, seeing the hopelessness of her mother-in-law, again, left the house that morning to do the only thing that was really left to them to, stay, to save them from starvation. Now, I don't know if somebody would have come and given them, I'm sure that probably would have happened. But they were on their own. And so Ruth does the only thing open to her. She goes to glean. Naomi allows her to go to glean, but you've got to believe Naomi was worried all day long. So, so now put yourself in Naomi's place. Ruth goes out to glean early in the morning, probably at sunrise. And they're doing the barley harvest, and she knows about gleaners. She knows how gleaners are treated, and she knows how gleaners from other countries are treated. She's got to be kind of on pins and needles all day, right? I mean, what you would be. And besides that, she's depressed. And she thinks that God hates her. She thinks that somehow she's suffering some sort of punishment from God for something she's you ever been there. Something she's done in the past, right? Maybe she feels guilty because they left Bethlehem, went to a foreign land, and, you know, Israelites really weren't supposed to do that, and they did. Whatever the reason, she is feeling God's hand is against her. And so she's got all that, all that baggage hanging around as she sends Ruth out that day, and it really is an incredible act of courage on Ruth's part. Anybody ever watch the old Mary Tyler Moore show? One of the early... One of the early um, again, I'm old, you, you know. Mary, you know, the boss was Lou Grant, right? Mary comes into Lou's office one day, and she said, I don't even remember what she said, but at the end, she was being plucky. She was being spunky, and, and Lou Grant said to her, Mary, you've got spunk. Oh, thank you, Mr. I hate spunk. <laughs> well, Ruth had spunk. And she went out to glean that day, and Boaz apparently liked it. So... It's quite possible that, that she was going into dangerous territory and a double stigma. She was poor and a foreigner. Naomi's wondering if she's going to be allowed to glean and all of that. So imagine Naomi's shock when Ruth comes home with a sack full of grain and leftovers. You know, all tied up in a nice little horse or whatever, however they tied the foil from leftovers at the restaurant of Boaz. So she comes home and there's, and there's all of this food. All this, all, I mean, they had nothing, and now they got a half month's worth in one day. So the first time in over 10 years since Naomi had left Bethlehem with her husband and two children, two boys, this is the first time that she's gotten anything like good news. I mean, it's all been gloom and doom up to this point for her. If it weren't for bad luck, she'd have no luck at all, right? So that, that's, that had pretty much been her life, and so she's shocked. And so she starts to pepper Ruth with questions. And you can, you can imagine the scene, right? Where did you glean today? Whose field did you go to? Before Ruth can answer one question, another follows, right? Oh, God, bless this man for doing it. And she doesn't even know who the man is yet. So she's going from questions to blessing, boom, 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 just like that. Where did you glean? Now, the narrator, as I was reading it, the narrator really draws it out. Ruth speaks, and if we could read it, it says, Well, the name of the man whose field I gleaned in today, that man's name, the name of the guy where I went to glean was Boaz. Okay, the writer, whoever wrote Ruth, and we don't know exactly who wrote Ruth, but whoever wrote Ruth is an extremely skilled storyteller. I mean, they, they really... The person really, you know, drew that out for all it was worth in the text. It's Boaz. So Naomi hears the name Boaz. And again, small community. Everybody knows everybody's stuff. Boaz. May he be blessed by Yahweh, whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. That she prays a prayer of blessing. Now, this is, of course, a blessing on Boaz. But what's interesting is the phrase, whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. It, it's, it's interesting for two reasons. First of all, it is unclear who the pronoun is referring to. If you ever write much and you, and you use pronouns, the rule is the pronoun usually goes to the nearest antecedent, right? Sometimes you got two near antecedents, so we have two in this. You have God and you have Boaz. Naomi says, and textually it's right, uh, uh, 
may he, may he be blessed by Yahweh, whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. Yahweh is the nearest antecedent. And so it's probably Ruth or Naomi is saying that Yahweh has, has practiced kindness. But it's also, and I think, again, Scripture is, is, um, is verbally plenary inspiration. In other words, every word is inspired. And so when we have something like this, which is a little bit unclear, I think it's probably unclear that God made it unclear on purpose because what's going on here is that the blessing that Naomi says, Yahweh, um, um, you know, whose blessing, uh, let me read it again because I'm lost, okay? Um, whose kindness is not forsaken, the living and the dead, is certainly Yahweh's kindness now. Now Naomi is seeing that, but it's happening through Boaz. And that little pronoun, which is not clear who it's referring to, I think refers to both. Both the Lord, but it's coming through Boaz. All right, the living and the dead, why does she say that? Why the living, and what the dead got to do with this? The dead are dead, right? So why does Naomi talk about this guy blessing the living and the dead here? Well, again, when we do a full description of Goel here, if you are an Israelite living at this time in this place, land was everything. Now, here's, here's the concept in Israel regarding land. It wasn't theirs. The land was God's. God brought them into the land, God owned the land, and he was allowing them to take care of the land. And as they came into to Israel in the book of Joshua, each tribe was given a section of land, some of them on the east side of the Jordan River, most on the west side of the Jordan River. They were, the land was divvied up among the 12 tribes of Israel, except the Levites, who were the priests. They didn't get land. See, even then... Poor pastor boys <laughs> had to scrounge for a living. All right, so they they were they didn't, but they they were operating. They they were the ones to take care of the of the religion, of the worship in Israel, and they received offerings and things like that. Kind of the same way it works today. So, but why this hinted? Because if you were an Israelite and you had sold your land for some reason, that meant things were really bad. And besides that, it wasn't really. Yours, you could sell it, but it didn't even belong to the person who bought it because every 49th year was this thing called the year of Jubilee. So if you had bought somebody's land to kind of help them out of a rough spot, let's say, you know, let's say Elimelech lived, but he needed to sell his land, and I went and bought Elimelech's land, but it was on the 48th year. That would mean that the next year I had to give, I would have to give it back to him. So you didn't have a lot of people buying land on the 48th year of the year of Jubilee, or they ignored it, which was going on. All right, so that's the way it worked. And also a family name. Now, we've just heard Charles talk about family names a little bit here. If a husband died, or if a man died, and he didn't have any kids... Then we had something called leveret marriage, which was supposed to take place if they had it. So the brother of the deceased husband was to, if they didn't have children, was to marry his former sister-in-law and have kids. But the, the first child born would not be his kid. It would be the kid of his brother. So the family name would be carried on. That's the way it worked. Now, we're not talking about leveret marriage here, even though eventually Boaz does marry Ruth. He fulfills two traditions at once, the kinsman redeemer, and in a sense, leveret marriage, even though he wasn't a brother of Malon, who had been Ruth's husband. So, that's what's going on. When, when she says the living and the dead, now we're getting a hint that Boaz might, he just might, maybe redeem their fortunes. He might step in and fulfill his role as a kinsman redeemer for the family, as a goel for the family. And by the way, her remark takes the reader back to Genesis 24 where the servant of Abraham goes abroad to find a wife for Isaac. And when he finds Rebecca, who's Isaac's wife, uh, he praises God in the same way. In fact, there are all kinds of allusions in the, in the narrative of Ruth that take the reader back to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what's going on in the story here is that Ruth, a Moabite, in case you forgot, Ruth is being likened to Rebecca, Sarah, 
Rachel, okay, the patriarch's wives back in Genesis, a Moabite. <laughs> Scandalous. But that's what's happening in it. So Ruth uh, or Naomi says, look, Boaz, he's a close relative of ours. What I mean, Ruth, is that he's a goel. I don't know if Naomi had explained this to Ruth yet. Apparently not. He's a goel. He's a kinsman redeemer. Kinsman redeemers are described, if you want to go back and look at it later, in Leviticus chapter 25 and also chapter 27. And, and uh, you have to understand, again, the importance of land, and we've already talked about that. Here's what they are responsible to do. They were responsible to buy property back for a family member who had been forced to sell it. So a kinsman redeemer would buy the property back for Elimelech's family to restore it, to redeem it for his family. Also, a goel would, if somebody had sold themselves, which, I mean, <laughs> you're really bad off, so you sold your land, and now the only thing you have to sell is yourself, and that happened, they'd sell themselves into something like indentured service, and a goel would redeem you, would buy you back, so you didn't have to be in that indentured servitude anymore. A goel would also seek justice if a family member had been murdered, by tracking down the killer and making sure that justice was served. So Goel had several responsibilities going on here. He can be, but in this case, he is not the brother of the deceased husband. So again, there's two traditions that eventually play out here in Ruth. That is the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, and the leveret marriage, the, the one, the brother, marrying the wife of his, of his brother, uh, and the child would belong to his deceased brother. Now, in this case, what ends up happening in Ruth is, I'm going to give it away, Ruth and Boaz get married at the end. Okay, you guys probably already knew that. The child that is born to them is not Boaz's child, it's Elimelech's child, the husband of Naomi. That's, that's so Na it, it's Naomi's family line that gets continued. So that's what Boaz can do. All right, then we have the tension, the tension. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. All right, so she keeps going out to glean every day. I don't know if she takes home 28 pounds every day, but she's, she's allowed to glean, and, and we already know she's being treated well. She continues to glean, presumably receiving great treatment from Boaz, but she's still living with her mother-in-law. That's the chapter ends. Nothing has happened yet. A period of time is going by, and Boaz hasn't done anything yet. Is he going to? Is he going to be the goel for the family? That's, that's how the chapter... And again, this wasn't written in chapters, but the, the writer leaves it open right now to set you up for what's coming next in chapter 3. All right. Now let's talk about our goel here just for a little bit. The first requirement of a goel is that there's a family relationship. Boaz was part of a Limelech's family. There was, they were the same clan, so to speak. Same family. A goel had to be in the family. For us, our redemption had to be purchased by somebody from our family. The whole point of Christmas, folks, is that the Son of God took on flesh, according to John in his gospel, and dwelt among us. God, the, God, the eternal spiritual being, and when, when I say spiritual, I'm not talking not real. Right? I think when we finally see heaven or when we see the new earth, we're going to find that the spiritual realm is pretty real. But God exists as spirit, doesn't have a human body as we know it. And the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, dwelt that way. When Paul writes about it in the book of Philippians, he's trying to tell this church, look, I want you to get along with each other. All right, can't we all... And, and to do that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have the same mind that Jesus had. 
This will help in your getting along with one another. What kind of mind was that? Well, it was the kind of mind that although he existed in the form of God, and that word morphe, the Greek word morphe, is, is like saying it's an icon, it's the exact copy of God. He existed in the form of God, but he did not regard it with equality with God in terms of personhood, not in terms of how they work things. He did not regard equality with God as something to be, and, and I'll paraphrase, something to be grasped so tightly to put a death grip on it. I'm not releasing this. This is a great privilege. But emptied himself. How did Jesus empty himself? Not by getting rid of something, <laughs> but putting on something. He emptied himself by taking on human form. He took on a body. All other miracles in Scripture kind of trace their origin back to that one from before that happened and, and after it happened. God became a man, and that was necessary for our redemption because the human race needed a second Adam, is how Paul puts it in Romans. The first Adam screwed up and put all of us into brokenness and sin. We can't obey our own laws, never mind God's laws. We can't. We're broken. We try, we want to, we fail. Always. And so one of us, our Goel, our kinsman redeemer, took on flesh. Had to be human. But he also had to be God. Why? Because no human being can suffer eternally and ultimately and take on the guilt unless he also is eternal. The God-man, Jesus. That's the theology behind the incarnation. So, Matthew puts it this way. Um, the passage I have for you, is starting from verse 18, but I, or, or is verse 21, I'm going to start reading from Matthew 2, 18. Matthew puts it this way. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, before they were married and had sex is what that means, all right? Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. That's how tight engagement was in those days. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Mary had already told Joseph that, but now an angel told him that. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, in Hebrew or Aramaic, Yeshua, Joshua, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what the name means, Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves, Yeshua. But he first had to become human. And that's the way Matthew describes it. And in Luke, Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, and the angel said to them, the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Messiah. Christ is Messiah. Messiah, the Lord. When Paul starts writing about all of this in Ephesians chapter 1, 7, writing about Jesus, chapter 1 is an incredible chapter describing Jesus. In verse 7, Paul writes that, In him, that is Jesus, we have redemption. Through his blood, there was a price. The forgiveness of our trespasses. There's another one I have here, Titus 2, 11 through 14, but I'm not going to read it. You can look at it. At the beginning of the message, I said that redemption always costs someone something. That is what redemption is. You, uh, buying back. Buying something back the more valuable the thing to be redeemed, the greater its redemption value. You and I 
are created in the image of God. Therefore, our redemption price is incredibly high. You and I are of infinite value to our Creator. When Jesus bought us back, it wasn't, here's three cents, give me the person, please. It was, here's my life. The God incarnate. I am the kinsman redeemer. I have become a man. I have left heaven to do this, to seek and save the lost. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. In the Christian story, God descends and then reascends. He comes down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down into a womb, down to the very roots in the seabed of the nature he has created. But then he goes up, and that's what Paul writes in Philippians, therefore God has highly exalted him. That the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Our goel had to become human to redeem us. And that's what he did. Now I used to show a lot of videos and there was one I showed years ago and I wish I'd show it right now because it would be better to see it than to have me describe it but we have some issues with sound and things like that. But Les Miserables, the musical, the original book by Victor Hugo, the movie, is all about redemption and there is a scene in Les Miserables, which is one of the most powerful scenes I've ever read in literature. It's the most powerful scene that I've ever seen on the screen. If you've seen it, you know the scene I'm talking about. Jean Valjean, who is the, quote, criminal, even though he'd only stole, stole a loaf of bread, is put away. And he comes out and he has to carry around this I'm a criminal card. And nobody wants to hire him. Nobody wants to welcome him in. So he goes to the only place that will take him in, and that is to the home of a priest. And he goes into the home that night, and he's all dirty and disheveled. The priest welcomes him in. The priest has a housekeeper there, and they're well. the housekeeper isn't so sure about this. The priest welcomes him in. They feed him. He's eating like an animal because he hadn't eaten in a while. They all go to bed, and in the movie version, not the musical version, Jean Valjean gets up in the book, too, and steals the silverware of the priest. No good deed goes unpunished, right? Steals his silverware. In the movie, the priest shows up and Jean Valjean decks him with a right cross to the jaw and leaves. Flip to the next scene in the movie version. The priest is talking to his housekeeper. The next day he's out working in the garden and the first word you hear is, don't worry, we'll eat with wooden spoons. Now, I don't want to hear any more about it. And then the police come with Jean Valjean. They had caught him red-handed with the priest's silverware, and they tell the priest, yeah, he told us that you gave it to him. And the priest walks up and says, that's right. I gave it to him. But Jean Valjean, you forgot the silver candlesticks. Why did you forget them? They're very valuable puts the candlesticks into his bag, asks the police to release him. I'm getting teary-eyed just describing it. And he says this, Jean Valjean, my brother. Whew. Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil. With this silver, I bought your soul. I've ransomed you from fear and hatred, and now I give you back to God. And in the book, the movie, the musical, Jean Valjean has this moment of redemption that he accepts. And his life takes a different course. That, folks, is redemption. That is what our goel has done for us. As the worship team comes up, we're going to continue our worship with our offering in just a little bit. Here's the next step. What do you do with this message of redemption? Kinsman, redeemer, goals, and all of that. 
I think there's only really one thing you can do this week or that I can do. This week, I would like you to think of ways that you can express your thanks to God for the gift of redemption. And what I'd like you to do is keep that seeing, if it helps, from Les Miserables in your mind, Jean Valjean, the guy who received graciousness from the priest and then stole and hit him, as thanks, being redeemed by the priest, who said, I now give you back to God. That is what's happened for us. The priest called him brother. He was a kinsman in that sense. It, 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 it plays out, and by the way, Victor Hugo meant to put those words in there. It was not an accident. That's what's happened with us. So this way, or this week, find some ways you, you can express your thanks to God for this gift of redemption. I don't know how, what, what form that might take. Maybe it's you're going to reach out to a neighbor this week. Maybe you're going to do something else. You, you understand you've been redeemed, and you're just thankful to God for it. Think of a way you can do that. As the ushers come forward, we'll receive our offering as we continue our worship. Lord Jesus, it is incredible. In this Old Testament story of these, these two widows who really had nothing, and then Boaz comes on the scene, and he is a potential Goel, a potential kinsman redeemer. There's no accident that this book of Ruth is in our Old Testament because it foreshadows perfectly what you did for us. And this time of year especially, we remember and we thank you for what we call the incarnation, that is God taking on flesh, lowering yourself to do that in an incredible way, to redeem us. Thank you, Jesus, for that great gift. And we pray this in your name this morning.